I loved his strange voice announcing every time. He's very spooky, like, uh huh, okay, what is it? But anyway, do you remember? Uh, oh my God. Odyssey, uh, now I have to think. Uh, the f Space Odyssey? Yes. The yes, film. Yes. Al 2000 was the name of the computer? Al. <laughs> yes, Al. Exactly. I know it's that I remember the, it came into my mind, the Italian title of the film, not the English one. So, very similar, but I have to. Oh, remember. I remember being in, I think it was in, yeah, it must have been in France um, years ago when um, Jaws came out and the title in French was Le Don de la Mer. <laughs> <laughs> in <laughs> Italian, it's not called Joe, it's called. Oh my God, I, maybe the shark? But it's not Joe at all. So when people were talking about Joe, I said, what, Joe, what is it? <laughs> it's an horror <laughs> film. And then everyone was, dun, 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 dun. Oh, yes, I think it was the, the, the shark. I have to check the title. I don't remember now in, in Italian anymore, but anyway. So everyone, no, welcome to everyone. We are here with splendiferous John Matthews, also called New Merlin. <laughs> Magician. <laughs> only, only by him, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, I know. But I like this Merlin figure. I mean, you are an expert in Arthurian legend and the figure of Merlin because I love it. And you are a wizard, an expert of tarot, uh, a magician, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's, it's fantastic to create this similitude, similitude between you and Merlin. I mean, well, I'll, Lots of things are in common. I will accept magician, and I'll tell you a little story if you if you like. Absolutely. Quite a long time ago now, probably twenty years ago, a friend of ours who sadly has passed on since then um, made a, a, a staff, a really big staff, taller than me. Uh, she didn't ask; she just was told to make it, and she was told to give it to me, and that when I took it, I was taking on the mantle of Merlin. Oh. And I said absolutely not. I am not doing that. I'm sorry. I'm not doing that. But she said, but I spent all this time making this beautiful thing. And it was beautiful. It was all carved with, um, with a Merlin on top. And so I said, well, look, here's what I'll do. I'm going to put it in my, st in my room, in this room, because I have all my sacred things on the shelf here behind me and other things in the room. And said, I'll leave it to them to decide what happens. So it went in there. Next morning I come in, it's on the floor. I pick it up again. Next morning, it's on the floor. So I put it just outside my door in a little kind of nook there. And I kind of forgot about it almost. And then Kathleen and I went out to dinner and our son had a party. And in the post of them having the party, a bunch of teenagers, the staff fell on the floor and the head broke off. No. I said, that's it. That is the very clear sign. It is not for me. So I called up my dear friend Jane and said, I'm really sorry, but, but, but told her all this. And she said, right, that's it. Take it outside and burn it. So mm -hmm. I did. I burned the staff and the, the hawk and everything because that was the end of that. So I'm very clear about not being even Merlin's follower. <laughs> I admire him greatly. And mm -hmm. I've done work with him. I've done magical work with him and in ritual. Um, but, um, no. <laughs> okay, then I will not call you like that anymore. We don't want to offend, the, I mean, Merlin. No, no. Okay, but it's great. I promise you, yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. I was about to say, oh, strange. Every time, I mean, we spend a lot of time in your studio for all the, the things we created together. And I never saw the stuff. So I said, it was there. I haven't noticed. And now I know why. Yeah, that's it. That was the story. Beauty. Yeah. Beauty. But I want to start with a very, a very strange question maybe, but it's something that interests me, intrigued me, because we created different tarot decks, we collaborated in different projects, and usually we work in a very communicative way, exchanging ideas and concepts and visions, and it's fantastic. But, I mean, you know the story of the Book of Shadows, or everything that is there, but I think this time I did something that is completely different because I give you the, 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 the deck as it was finished. And then I said, say whatever you want, because it was, I refused to give you any point of view, 
my point of view, any lines, any guidelines, anything. What do you thought about it? Well, I mean, um, it was it was a bit of a, a shock actually to be to not have you giving me your opinions because usually we argue a lot about our own ideas of these things. But um, I think you know what first struck me was was how powerful they are and how the color that you've added um, since the original versions is so extraordinarily powerful and brilliant. Um, and they they leapt out at me. You know, I mean, I know. Mm -hmm. The basic meanings of tarot very well but when I looked at these I saw other ones and so basically what I did I listened to them I listened to what they had to say um, and I tried to be poetic in what I wrote because they are them so the images themselves are very poetic so I just uh, I just let them talk to me really so if I, there's anything wrong it's your fault <laughs> no I, I love it I mean I really love it because every time I have questions from people say, oh, it's because no one saw your writing because I refuse to deliver it. I don't want people to have just a little bit here and a little bit there because it's something that is like having a good meal just in disorder and eating a little bit of more so here, a little bit of more so there and not having it from beginning to end. You don't have a, a, a feast like that. You have to celebrate in a different way. So no one read what till, still, till now, what you wrote. So I describe it, but the things that I really, really liked is the, put, the poetic aspect of your writing. I think is is really, really interesting. And then, I mean, I don't know if I ever told you, or maybe we discussed it, I don't remember. When, I mean, we wanted to collaborate together to this process, but the project, but I wanted to remove myself for the process because if I said, okay, I draw this, I've said to you, I draw this card, having this in my mind, I think I have guided you in a direction that I didn't want to, because I really wanted to know, to discover what you think without me being a filter, because at the end, I pretend to have discovered this deck. I didn't say that I created the deck. So if I discover the deck, you are the expert during the narration in the graphic novel, I come to you to asking you to explain the meaning of the cards. So I don't know anything, I have to pretend to not, not anything about the cards, I need something. And I think that something that really, really struck me from the first time you st started to send me your lines is not just the poetic aspect, but I create something that is fictional, that is pure fantasy to try to explore and understand better our reality. But what you did is not just giving the the meaning of the tarot, but to create a connection between the fantasy that I created with real historical references. And I found that was, wow, was incredibly deep, incredibly powerful, because it, it looks like that world that is fictional now is more real, or reality becomes a little more fiction. I mean, it's like open the door of magic in different ways. <clears throat> no, I agree completely. I mean, uh, that was in as much as anything was intentional, that was intentional because, um, you know, we've discussed in the past when when you first presented the Book of Shadows and then when we worked together on the Tower of Light and, and Shadow, um, <clears throat> that although it's, it's exciting to build on an invented universe, which is very close to this one in most ways, really, um, you need to anchor it a little more. And that's what I tried to do when I did when I looked at the meanings and also the descriptions of mm. them. You know, looking at them, you see these, you see the immediate parallels. And sometimes I wanted to just bring the parallels out, and sometimes I wanted to leave them where they were. You no, know, it's it's fantastic. But you know that I have whenever I say this little story, I have always people that asking me oh, but what do you think about the meaning of the cards? And I start thinking that I don't know if I ever say what I really think about the cards I draw. I started to do videos, technical videos, explaining why I decide to use one color instead of another, or why sometimes the proportions of the object are not realistic, because everything has a meaning. So very, very technical. But I don't know if I want to explain my meaning of everything, because I think that everyone has to find their own meaning in the tarot cards. And I like that you will guide them to do it. 
because the way you do it is is very how can I say co coherent logical and it's funny because it's just a part of the full book of the full project but everything is so like the part of Rana the, the, the Rana wrote and the part that Sasha wrote but everything at the end is so cohesive it's like the same threads changing colors every time is I don't know it's something that is fascinating it, it, it was here at the beginning and when you started to see in reality I mean soon even printed is is interesting is beyond what I thought to be yeah, well, I think it's. I, I think that you know, you you describe what you want, what your meanings are in the paintings. You know, I mean, you are first and foremost an artist, visual artist. Yeah, I know that you have many other ways of interpreting things, and obviously, you're also very vocal in your own understanding of what you've done. But I think what I what I was looking at was to say, all right, well, Andrea is standing out of the way for the moment. I have to fill in for him, you know, so I was kind of tuning into you as well <laughs> and trying to, I mean, you know, it was a juggling act, to be honest. Yeah. And it, yeah. If it works well, then I'm really pleased because uh, it wasn't easy, you know. I mean, if I didn't know you at all, I'd probably have given up. But really? Because, well, this is interesting. I never thought about it. <clears throat> well, it's stuff, you know, you look at the art, you look at the images and you think to yourself, what does that mean? Um, and you take the you know, some of the, the, the different suits and how you've organized them. And the characters, of course, are completely different from, you know, they're not any old king and queen or page or whatever. Mm -hmm. They are very much Andrea Astley's king and queen. <laughs> yeah. and that, that was interesting to do because they, as I said, I let them speak for themselves. Most of them were quite rude, but they did speak to me. And I just put, wrote down exactly. I wrote down what they were saying as much as possible. You know, no, so. it's, it's, it's interesting. It's really, really interesting because, I mean, I never thought about it because we already, I mean, we are friends, we collaborate in many projects, there is a lot of trust. So, I, I mean, when I came to you with this, I want you to write something about this project because it really, I mean, I, I, I adore your writing. I really love it. You know, and I'm a huge fan of your book. So, I mean, I, I really like it. So, it's perfect. No, then I, I mean, for this project, I, you know, I can collaborate for everyone everyone I want because is is a project of mine. I am the author, I am the publisher, so I can do whatever I want, total freedom. But I wanted to work with someone that for me is special, not just for the, how can I say, for, for the knowledge they have. I don't want just the best for their knowledge, but I want to work with someone that is deeply connected with me, my world, because they know me, because we already did something, or because we connected in, in, a, in a deeper way. So with Sasha, with Rana, we, we met in real life. We have incredible experience talking, reading, discussions. So, so And then all of them are different aspects that connected to me. Like Rana, is, uh, Rana uh, Sasha is working in, uh, in the film industry. So she is an actress too. So she's a writer too. So there was a lot of different interesting things. Then there is Rana that is more sensitive and she has a lot of other experience. So open, she opens different doors and intrigued by that. And then there are you and you work in, in so many different fields too, from films to scripts for film, from I mean, your own books and then the tarot also is, I mean, I think your expertise is so big that taking uh, this multimedia project, I mean, he will be the perfect person. I mean, who else? I mean, it's, it's, it is an extraordinary project in every way because, I mean, you know, the terrors there are by the ton, and I've done quite a few myself, as you know, and we did, uh, we've already done one, one and a half together. <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, but when it comes to it, I don't think there is another package out there that will have all the things, this, the aspects that this has. And if you remember, we had a long discussion about whether you should put them all in one package. And yeah. I, I still think you shouldn't. But you, you're doing it. It's going to look amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. No. To have a deck and then to look at a story about the deck featuring the characters from the deck is amazing. Uh, I think you're including a video as well. Are you a DVD? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not a DVD. It would be a digital download because, you know, the computer now has not the DVD player anymore. It would be easier and faster. So it would be a digital download. So you can access from everywhere and it would be easier.
So all these different aspects, how do you see them combining? Very well, because you know that I started long ago the idea of the Book of Shadows as the first Book of Shadows was, I feel it was like an acorn of the project it is now, because something was missing in the first Book of Shadow, was missing the part containing the, the magical of tarot, the magic of tarot. There was the explanation of the origin of tarot, there was the mystic of tarot, but not the real magic. This time I wanted to focus on the creational magic, the creation of tarot. And I think there was an author, I don't know if you ever stumble in it, maybe we already talked about it, I, I don't remember, is uh, Ioan Petru Culianu. He oh. was a professor of, uh, well, professor of religion, compare religion, something like that, he was a philosopher. In, at Boston University, and he wrote a book that really changed my perspective on tarot, on magic. The book is called uh, Magic and Eros in the Renaissance. Right. And is a deep analysis of Giordano Bruno and all the Renaissance Italian, typically, well, yes, Italian uh, magicians, uh, philosopher and magician. And he analyzed from Plato to the Renaissance, the concept of Eros, as a bond for magic. And he defined, in one sentence, it struck me open a lot of different way of thinking. He defined magic as a science of the imagination. Okay. And I really, really love it. And he said, yes, because before, we used to think about like moving through space is an act of magic. Flying on a carpet is an act of magic. Talking with someone that is not present, sending messages is an act of magic. But now all this magic is coming real through technology to develop development. So he talked, he, he defined magic like the ability of imagining a world that is not still here and bring it to reality. But then he connect all the, how can I say, the technical philosophical part like Giordano Bruno, the Vincolis. So all this philosophy of connection bonds between people. But it's, it's a book that really changed my life. And then I think that Ted glue everything together because you have a deck of cards, you have a graphic novel that page after page turning a book of magic, a real book of magic, where you have the meaning of the cards, some spread, explanation of different way of doing the reversal. Then you have a book in the book because there is the tome, the manuscript of the alchemist, which is the code in the story. But I created new pages for the manuscript to insert the connection between the four elements, the four suit of a playing card, like a poker French playing cards, and then the tarot. So everything is connected. And then the film is like a big documentary about everything. So when you navigate through the deck, through the book and the film, it's like plunging in, a, in another universe. What I really wanted to do or to convey is the feeling of magic. And you cannot have I mean, I don't know if you have the same feeling when you buy a beautiful deck, you open the booklet and the booklet is written or presented as graphic, like it was a list of errands, completely cold, no magic there, very aseptic, very rigid. Mm. I think that if you want to use magic, if you want to be magical, you have to recreate the feeling of an ancient book of magic. And creating, I mean, when I did... I think that something to shape a lot of my, my ideas is Mebius. I discovered Mebius very recently, a few years ago. You know, the French uh, uh, band dessinée. He was drawing uh, graphic novels. It was the French called band mm. And his saga is absolutely fantastic. Really transcendent, very philosophical, and I love it. So I think it was inspired by all these kind of different situation and I put together in my cauldron and then the Book of Shadows and Alchemy Story came, came alive. Well, I mean, I think, you know, what you say about imagination uh, and magic is absolutely true. I mean, I always say, I, I teach shamanism and I always say to my students, one of the very first things I say to them at the beginning of the course is to say that in a certain sense, and you have to be careful how you put this and how people take it, we invent ourselves, we create ourselves from our imagination. We have an idea of who we are, of who we want to be, of what we want to do. And as far as it's possible, we create that. It isn't always possible, and that's why a lot of people are very disappointed with their lives, because they feel they haven't done, 
they haven't brought into being that person that they imagined that they would be. But I always think imagination anyway is the strongest tool that we have for understanding, for for, for magic indeed, for, for creativity generally. I mean, of course, there'd be no novels, there'd be no fiction, there'd be no films, there'd be no plays if people didn't have imagination and weren't able to imagine themselves into a situation, a story, a scene, a character. Um, but it's bigger than that, isn't it? It's not just about making things up for uh, for a story. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have, have um, you know, when I, again, when I'm teaching people shamanism, we do, we go on journeys and people will come back with this most amazing journey that they've had and they'll describe it all in great detail with lots of color. And then very often they'll say, it's a shame that was just my imagination. And this, this, this is when I go off on one because I say, no, of course it's your imagination, but take out the word just because, and there's a point anyway in journey work where if you describe uh, where you're going, for instance, if, you, if I say to someone, you're going to try, climb a tree in your, in your imaginary se self, you're going to climb a tree to the top. Um, and I often say to them, and they get very shocked when I say this, pretend, pretend that you are doing that. And I guarantee that within two or three seconds of starting, they're not pretending anymore. It's become real for them because the imagination kicks in and the imagination makes it real. And that's, that's really the whole business. And of, oh, what is, yeah. No, what you say is incredibly fantastic. And I, lived, I think that, I mean, something that struck me is immediately when you start talking is the opposition between finding yourself and creating yourself through your imagination. I think our social, our culture was too focused for too long on the concept of find your real self, find yourself like you were lost. You are lost somewhere, you are lost in this life and you have to find yourself. Yeah. But I think this, if we think about ourselves like an act of magic, when every day with the power of your imagination, your fantasy, you create yourself, you will be in a better place. Because if you focalize and you focus on what you want to be, and then you move to what, in, towards a direction, you don't find yourself, you build yourself. Yeah. And I think it's is something really, really, really important. Then, when you say, yes, imagination is really important to, to understand reality. And every time I, when people say, wow, how? Because it's just, it's just imagination, it's just a fantasy. But yeah. I say, yes, but think about whatever beautiful, I mean, well-written science fiction book you have in mind. Usually it's created by an, with following assumption. It's taking something and it's not working in our society putting it in is extreme and see how society react. It's like creating a fictional world that is parallel, is a possible future of this world to analyze what we can do to avoid it. I mean, every one of us, I think, saw Blade Runner, which is horrible, dark cities, raining, which is fallout, re react, uh, re radioactive fallout, and then all these fake animals because there are no animals anymore. Well, this is a possible future that can be our nearest future if we don't act immediately, if we don't change the way we we exploiting, we are exploiting the planet. So is it an act of imagination? Yes, but is an act of imagination to open us new window of, let's say, perception or make us aware of something? And well, I think it's, it brings it into focus. You know, you can have a you can have a very vague and very <clears throat> uncertain uh, image in your mind of what that might look like. You know, I'm thinking, I'm particularly thinking since you mentioned science fiction of Dune. Oh. You know, I, mean, I know of no book that better uh, evokes what it is saying. You know, it's not just a question of writing it down. If you're writing it down, your thoughts, it's philosophy, let's say. But yeah. when you make it into something as real as that book. Tolkien's Middle Earth, another one. I mean, everywhere yeah. they're all around us. Going yeah. back to William Morris, the, the the news from nowhere. I mean, these were all books that brought something that wasn't there into being. Yeah. Um, and somebody, I can't remember who it was now. There's there is actually a science fiction story. I've forgotten who wrote it. Maybe someone else will remember. Maybe you remember. Um, in which uh, every time someone dreams up a new story, it's actually real in another dimension. 
so you're actually giving birth to a new a new world a new universe by just dreaming about it in in creating it in that way i remember something similar by philip dick but i'm not sure it is because philip dick was always him uh, it can be, be it can be i mean i'm not sure but i remember a few books of him he's always this membrane between reality and fiction that or virtual reality it is always not there. So every time you read his book, you'd never know what is real, what is imagination, what is happening. And I love, I love for this reason. I mean, Philip Dick is completely, I mean, he's like LSD book. I mean, he's amazing. He's really, really... That's not surprising, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but it's, it's interesting. I think we have to focus, I mean, we should focus more about our the de development of our imagination our fantasy and unfortunately in our society i think there is always this like castrating act of the parents say oh no you have to grow up start be a child start to imagine while the most interesting person that i met and i frequent they are still child even if they are incredibly older than me and i love them for that because they are never lost is in the connection with the inner child. They are able to use the fantasy to, to create, to open windows for others. Well, I mean, when I was when I was little, um, you know, I was always seeing, you know, the beings all over the place. You know, I'd go for a walk in the park and I'd say, who's that man in the tree? <laughs> or, you know, we'd go, or I'd see someone walking across the floor in our sitting room who was only half above above the floor and the rest of him was invisible and i would say this and my mother would look at me and say you've got too much imagination well i'm glad to say i kept it i did not throw it all away as so many people do do yeah no i am really happy for you because it is is i mean is a key to be happy too I mean. it's incredibly powerful no question yeah i see those things all the time now and i don't think about it anymore occasionally I I, maybe i'm mad but you know um no. <laughs> no, 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 you know now that I'm incredibly curious and I would like to know everything about your vision or what you see. I mean, you should write a book about it. I don't, I don't know if it's describable in words, you know. I, I know mean, when I see, when I look at someone, um, and they, may I hasten to reassure our, our, our loyal viewers here that I'm not doing this to you, but um, <laughs> it, with permission, I will look at someone and I see what is really there, not just the face that they have on them if you know mm. what I mean by that and also aura I mean the, the, when I was in my teens I was part of a group down in Sussex who nowadays would be called witches but they they just laughed whenever you mentioned that because uh, for them they were they were for, they they had a lineage going back to the middle ages and for them you know what was what passes for witchcraft today again no insult to anyone um, was was not the same and um, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Where was I going with this? Um, that that um, um, yes, I had to. I was taught how to see auras, and the reason, the way they did it was to say I had to close my eyes, and then I had to open them again, but without opening them. <laughs> Interesting. A long time and a lot of practice to be able to do that. I can imagine that. Once, once it clicks, then. If I want it, if I want to, and unless the person in question has very strong shields, I can see it immediately. I so love I it. No, it's, it's so. very interesting. I think we have lost this, this connection between, let's say, the, I don't want to say the occult. I prefer to speak about the magic in the world. I think we have, we have lost it. And I would like, to, I mean, I like that people rediscover it in different ways, in different forms. Yeah. And... I think nothing, I mean, it's interesting. It's something that is always inspiring. You never know where you... Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a house of treaties. <laughs> Couldn't resist it. So I like, you know, mine is less. Oh, it's yeah. one of my building. <laughs> this is one of the first commission I have when I come, well, when see, I move to London. So I have the commission to create objects. You see, you've created a, a world for yourself that is absolutely here. But absolutely not here. Yeah, at the time. you know. I mean, you're in two places at once. You have one foot in each world, well, which is quite a rare achievement, I think. But you know, I see it's, you. it's a dangerous thing. I, I want to ask you something because this is something that is absolutely crazy. And every time I say this, people look at me very, very badly. 
when I was writing the Book of Shadows, you have no idea many times I was chopping my food, cooking, you know that I love cook, cooking. So I was there cooking every day, of course. So I preparing my meal and I was listening. I have the presence of Ara Destin. It is one of my main character of the alchemist on my side say okay no I didn't do something like that this is the real story and we started to tell me the story and I have to stop cooking doing everything and going down it was like being present in another space with my character so sometimes you say how did you they ask me how did you invent it I say well actually I didn't I just wrote down what they to- they told me did you have the same crazy feelings? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you're right. I'm sure. I'm sure you you guys are all going. Mm. But anyway, um, but it is it's true. I've done it again and again. I did something called the Lost Tower of Nostradamus. Oh, I remember that. Yes. And it was based on some paintings that had been discovered that were done by his son, and it was very evident to me, anyway, that he started to make a tarot but he, decided, he died before it was finished. So basically, I sat down with uh, another artist friend of mine, Will King, and, and we, re, we, we worked out what it would look like. We used oh. the art that, uh, that, that Nostradamus' son, Cesar, had made, um, but we added things to it, and we, we made it into a tarot. Um, and it was extraordinary. But all the time, when I got down to, to writing it, I was aware of Nostradamus on my shoulder going, no, that's wrong. That's not what I meant. And the same thing um, when I, this, the book that I was showing you earlier. Which Please you, do it because you, I, not I, everyone was here. This is one of the most beautiful book. I, oh, yeah. This is just literally just out. Um, and it's incredibly beautifully illustrated by John Howe, who is the artist, one of the artists who worked on Lord of the Rings. John and I have been friends for quite a few years, and um, when this opportunity came up, I asked him to do pictures, and he did 15 wonderful plates like this. Um, what this is, is I've called it a new Mort Arthur, because basically this is some of the many hundreds of stories that Mallory did not include in the Mort Arthur in the 15th century. And I invented a character mm. of a scribe a nameless scribe, probably from maybe a little later than Mallory, who worships Sir Thomas. And um, he, he, he goes, well, why did, why did Sir Thomas leave out this story? And why didn't he tell that one? And here's another one that I found. And so we ended up with, there are 38 stories in this book, and hopefully there's going to be a second and maybe even third volume if the publishers are patient enough. Um, and um, there are so many. There are so many of them. But while I was writing them, I had on my little shrine here, I, I pasted up this, which is, I don't know, even know who did this, but this mm-hmm. is an anonymous picture showing Sir Thomas Mallory in prison, writing his book, because he, uh, he was in prison for most of the time that he wrote it. All the way through the book, he's always saying, please pray for me while I am on life, a knight's prisoner. And the reasons he was in prison well, a variety of things. He was accused of everything from uh, burglary to rape. Um, and rape in those days didn't mean the same thing that it does today, necessarily. It meant stealing something. But anyway, he was also, unfortunately, he was a soldier. And he fought during the Wars of the Roses. And he fought on both sides and changed sides several times. Not nice. <laughs> the, he then, in the end, ending up on the wrong side, as it were, the losing side. So he was, he was a political prisoner. And when the Roars of the Roses ended, everybody else who was in um, the prison in London um, was set, set free, except for Sir Thomas. Um, and then he gets, got sick and was finally released, and then he died. And um, he was buried in um, a little park, churchyard, um, just next to St. Paul's Cathedral. And on the 21st of this month, if anyone's around, I don't know where you, whether you all are, whether you're even in this country, but if you're in L- anywhere near London on the 27th, no, well, never mind. We're having a little celebration there, a celebration of Sir Thomas's life. And I'll be reading some bits from the book, and then we'll go around the corner to Daunt's Bookshop and have slap-up 
feast with wine and nibbles and everything. So I will be there for sure. I know you're I coming. Want to. You are, absolutely. So, oh, yeah. but I mean, where, where all this was going, this is what I was saying, I started to talk about this. It wasn't just to plug the book. It was that I was aware of this all the time. Everything I wrote, um, I, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the little scribe who has no name is me, of course, really. It's just my, it's like my alter ego. Yeah. All the time I was writing or the, or the scribe was writing, <laughs> I was aware of Mallory in the background going, that's a good one. Or, oh, <laughs> that character really shouldn't be in there. He's not brave enough to be a knight at the round table. And I really listened to that. So, I mean, I think again, you know, yes, call me crazy if you like, but I mean, I mean, many writers have, have mentioned this kind of thing that the characters take over and start speaking for you. And most writers will tell you that when they do that, that means you've got something good. I agree. No, I agree because you are what they call it the zone, but it's, it's strange because you don't have the control of the storyline anymore. But losing the control, I, I mean, for me, is incredibly fascinating because you're discovering the, the story while you are creating it. It's not that you're just writing down something that you know everything about because it would be boring. It's, it's like when I was painting that. I didn't know what was coming there. I started to have feelings and image, of course, you, you have an image, but then when in the color, I mean, in the sketching is, is there, but then when you start coloring, things change and evolve. And at the end, the painting is completely different from what you have in mind. And so is, is the book. And so is the book of shadows. I mean, when I started, I never thought to, I mean, I always wanted to do my first graphic novel, but I never thought it was so, I don't want to say so demanding because yes, it was the incredibly demanding. Every single page is like a selection. I mean, a collection of paintings, but so it was falling like in the rabbit hole. I mean, it's like the tunnel to another world. And while I was creating it, I was incredibly happy. Even if I have to overwork a lot, many, many nights, but it's like, what happened next? Give me, give me more, give me more. And because the process is so, long it takes a lot of time to reach that point and uh, i found it fascinating oh absolutely i mean i mean i i kind of like to know where i'm going i mean i've written i've written several children's novels and um i always work out roughly where it's going to end so we put it that way the bit in between is the discovery exactly. um, I, know going, I know where i'm going and of course sometimes it changes and i love it when characters come in you know i mean i I wrote a, a children's book about the young King Arthur not long ago, and it's all about him discovering, it's the first of a quartet that I haven't finished yet. Uh, the first one was about him getting the sword, and the sword in my version is a sword that's made of volcanic and, uh, and um, meteoratic um, iron and, and other things. Um, and I had in it the Questing Beast, which is a character that you find in the Arthurian legends. It's kind of its name is Glatisant, and it's kind of, it's part of, part leopard, part snake, part lion, part everything else, you know? And it's, it exists entirely to be sought for. Uh, well, I put this in my book, and it, as a guardian of the sword. And when I got almost to the end, I was describing um, how Arthur actually has to walk out across uh, a bridge over, over, over molten lava. Um, protected by Merlin's magic and he gets the sword and as he's going across there I suddenly found the questing beast had come out of a little hole in the rock fine at fight up in because they're in a huge cavern and it sings and it sings the story of Logris of Arthur's kingdom and all the things that are going to happen now I had no idea that was coming but it I mean it still gives me shivers when I say it now at the time I was sort of you know my hand was shaking um, but it's like when it when that happens when stuff pops through it's no longer imagination it's real yeah and that's i think and i get that feeling of, from a lot of what you do um you know i mean I'd, I'd like to ask you a question please no please please it's a dialogue <laughs> ever since we've known each other um i've i've always known that you had this vision of the alchemist and of making that story be part of the tradition of tarot where did that really come from? I mean, where did that idea of bringing your vision into tarot in that way, not just as art, but as a story? 
it's it's such a, it's such a strange origin because if I I mean I try to answer in a short time because otherwise it would be hours. Hmm. I have a feeling no because I, everything started from a feeling, and the feeling was I it was a very strange moment in my life because I mean I was not happy when I was living in Italy. Uh, it's difficult for an artist living there. So let's say so. It was I was quite depressed. Then there was. My mother was finally happy and I mean, a lot of situation and I wanted to celebrate my mother's life in my life. I mean, what she did with me and have like an exhibition celebrating her just to just to have a, like a, a smile between us, a joke and present it to a, to a gallery. The idea was to recuperate, recover the feeling of magic that she brought for all our childhood, me and my brother, with all the rituals she was doing, there was North Italian rituals, a lot of magic, she was a tarot reader. I said, so tarot is a lot of time and I don't think about tarot and I don't see my mother reading tarot. And I, I go back to my mother and say, but are you still reading tarot? I say, yes. And so she started to read for me again and everything. And I remember when I was a child and my mother was reading tarot. So I wanted to, to recover the feeling of magic. And so I started to think about painting taro, oil on canvas. Then I said, no, it's the wrong medium because it's not fantastic enough for me. I need something different. So I started to create taro that looks antique. Then from that, I started to create a book. I mean, while I was drawing the taro, an alchemist, the image of an alchemist started to materialize in my head. And was the alchemist creating the taro? But then if you have an alchemist creating the tarot and the tarot, you have to connect the story. You have to tell the story connecting them. And so I created the book of the, the alchemist, but it was just images. But the, while drawing the images, the images started to, to materialize in very fantastic short stories. And so I wrote them down. Then to explain everything, I created a documentary because you need to connect everything. And this was the first part of the Book of Shadows. But then some part was missing. The colors were missing, were missing. I wanted to use the colors because that one was brownish and reddish and black. I wanted to have the full power of my colors and the new sensitivity and then the new knowledge of magic I have. And so I started to narrate everything from the old book of shadow, the new one with the graphic novel the, and the graphic novel becomes the book of magic and everything. And so all the storylines were connected. It's like when you started just to think about a poem that you want to write and you ended up with the Divina Commedia. You don't want to write the Divina Commedia because it's too much. Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, you want just to start with a line. You have just an idea. And I started with that idea. But that idea was so powerful that it was growing in my head. And every time I said, it's over, it's done, is something else came. Then my mother passed away in, in, in a horrible way with a lot of suffering. And so this project became like the legacy, something that I wanted to, uh, to communicate, to transfer to other people. Uh, a vision of, uh, let's say, a vision of life that is my own, her own, the idea that every moment can be a pivotal moment, that you can change your life, that every moment is as a particle of sacred and secret, the mystery of life, the mystery of, life, uh, of magic. And so I went on, and I think this is, I don't want to say the final chapter, but I would like to be like the final chapter in the Alchemy Saga, because then I have spin-off, but it would be pure animations without tarot, pure graphic novels without tarot, but it will be the same world going on and on and on. I, it's like, I don't know if Terry Pratchett wanted to create a universe with his stories and everything. I think it started with a book and the book took over and the world took over. And at the end, at the end of his life, he created something that is incredibly huge and incredibly beautiful. I yeah. hope to have answered you. Um, yeah, that's a good. That's, that is a good answer. That was the short answer. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know me. <laughs> no, I think that's incredible. Um, I mean, I can see the process in that, and I'm, somehow I never really asked you that before. But it's it, it's always intrigued me that you, you know, it wasn't enough just to do a tarot 
even with your own art, with your own vision, but you had to bring in the story, you had to open it out further. So this is going back to the imagination, the importance of the imagination again. I think that if you create a tar if I create a tarot deck and I stop there, it's like if I did half of the job. If I want to create something magical, magical is a, is a, is a storytelling process. So see, you have to tell a story. I mean, think about Homer. Why we still read Homer or we read Shakespeare? Or we, because you find your life, you find yourself, you find your sorrow, you find your hope, your joy, your misery. You find the human condition. Like well, what, you, what a French, a French writer, writer says, la comédie humaine. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's, that's, that's completely true. I mean, these ancient, especially the ancient story texts like the Odyssey and Iliad and so on, um, you know, they do encapsulate all of human understanding and nature, really. It might not be modern, it might not be dressed up in modern clothes, or they might not be carrying a cell phone rather than a sword, but, you know, it's still the, the, the response of it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, the, the Arthur book, because a lot of people had been saying, well, is, is it still relevant? Do those stories matter anymore? How can you ask something so, oh, for me, it's, it's silly. It's like, are books important? Of course, we read books to, to know that we are not alone. Sometimes a book is more honest than a person because he's able to say straightforward a message that we were not able to receive in another way. I mean, think about Rumi. He's one of the most important and beautiful po poet I ever found. And I mean, how many years ago died? 1,000 and I don't know, it was 1,600, something like that. So okay. tough, rough. Wow, but his poetry is still relevant. When you read Sappho. Well, I mean, I've... I've... Why? I mean, his love is still the same. No, I mean, it always makes me kind of, you know, it's, it's, it makes me steam a bit when that when people say that. I mean, I've I've been very interested and have done several decks that have, you know, relationship to literature. I did the Beowulf Oracle last year based on that incredible poem, which, again, is full of things that you recognize in yourself. Um, and I also did um, Goblin Market Tarot, which is based on um, a poem by Christina Rossetti, um, Victorian poet and um, as soon as you start looking at these works you see well I see tarot imagery it pops up now it's almost hard to stop getting it I wish I could read a book without seeing tarot imagery sometimes but um, it's important I think that the the literature and especially the mythology I mean you know we were talking about the way people would say it's just my imagination what about those people who say a myth is just a lie Oh, no, a myth is one of the most powerful way to understand ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I I always told you, maybe I always tell around. So I don't know if I told you, but one of the books that changed my life <laughs> was Faust by Goethe. Oh. After every, I mean, you know that I love the, the figure of Mephistopheles and the devil, even the tarot is one of my favorite cards ever. After having read one of the passages when the devil explain how to live fully with Mephisto, I realized how I was not living my life as I wanted. Uh, I was a teenager and I was in the closet. I closed the book and I went out to the water saying I'm gay. And I mean, if, if people think about it, what? Faust change your life? They say, yes, Faust changed my life. He gave me the courage because I see, wow, Mephistopheles is this incredibly energy without constraint. And I said, I want to be like that. I want not, I, I don't want to be constrained. I don't want to constrain myself anymore. And so I exploded. Everything changed from that moment. Well, so books a... save lives, books change life. Of course they do. I mean, how can you not be changed by something as profound as these things you know i mean the you know even the you mentioned dante which has always been one of my favorite reads Me too. um and um you know he says it all right in the beginning midway through this life i awoke and found myself in a dark wood yeah dark wood it's so strange to, to listen it in english <laughs> that phrase has obsessed me for many years and a lot of what i've written um you know particularly when i did the wildwood tarot and now the one i'm doing on robin hood it's always about the forest. The forest is very important. Yeah. Uh, because it is a metaphor. In the yeah. same way, the maze, 
and the labyrinths that we've discussed a lot about. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Those are metaphors for life. It's yeah. not coincidental that if you look at a human brain, it looks like a maze. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I mean, you out. know, Dante is one of my great passion. I read and read Dante so many times that. I mean, I love it. Above all, the Inferno is absolutely fantastic. It's pure poetry, but it is it's life. But anyway, we have just 10 minutes and I would like to open to everyone. And if some of you have a question to ask, please, because otherwise we are going on talking about literature at tarot. And I really love how our talking about tarot brings up, brings literature and art and different aspects because at the end it is day life and i love it it's their essence doors to other reality so if someone of you have questions please they are welcome leap in now's your chance the silence was deep okay um Brandy. Is you need to unmute yourself so I can hear you. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's a question, but you know, I'm a, I'm a actual hippie generation. You know, my daughter is here. She is. You can't see her. And uh, when you said about the way people are brought up, um, being, you know, that, and you get to a point where your imagination is closed down. You know, your parents close it down, which my parents did to me. Bless them. But my daughter just laughed quietly and said that we hadn't done it to her. And I think there is there is a strain in British culture because of the whole hippie thing, which is not like that. But there's an awful lot that is. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a thought. Than a... Well, I mean, I tried to do we tried to do that with our son um, to let him have the full freedom of what he was thinking, what he was feeling and so on. And he's ended up very straight very very straight indeed and you know it's like all this magic stuff well no nothing like that won't have anything to do with that uh, so you you know you can't dictate you, you you have to let it just happen but our grandchildren uh we have two girls now um uh, one of them at least is definitely going somewhere like that i'm sure <laughs> i love it <laughs> but uh, the one who's now nearly three is definitely full of magic hope she doesn't lose it yes well, it's, i think what what do you say about this country is fantastic because from the moment I came here, I, I perceived this kind of magic aura. In Italy, unfortunately, we didn't have the 60s, like in, here in this country or on, in the States. We didn't have Woodstock of the Island Man because there is the, 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 the Democrazia Cristiana, the Christian party with the Christian value to compress society in such a way in a very very conformistic way and we see the result even now is imagination is dead there are very few people that believe in the in the power of imagination in following your dreams you have to find a serious job you have to find you have to have a house a regular job and boring job i mean it's this kind of mentality very very conservative so i perceive it here and i love it i feel in my, in my element We've, we've certainly produced a few amazing writers in that respect, certainly. You know, I mean, Tolkien, Neil Gaiman, Pullman, mm. you know, now and in the past, back to Morris and all of those. So, sorry, you were going to say, Brandy, I interrupted you. Oh, oh no, Rob, oh, what were you saying? Say it again. What was I saying? About what? Oh, about the Renaissance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Rob, Rob just said that the, oh, Brian might have been Alex, said, um, you Italians, you have the Renaissance and you frightened yourselves and you've never done it since. Good point. Think, Good point. But I also, we were, we were, were, A, we were talking about politics in this country and the people who appear to be in power. You don't have any imagination. I no, mean, that, that, no, no, we were not talking about magic, no. but just they don't, they've got no vision of anything. Unfortunately. You know, you know, why don't we encourage people to have a mortgage? Yeah. I think that's the world around because I'm, I'm in Australia ah, and um, it's exactly the same over here. <laughs> yeah, so like there's no imagination, you know, it's all sport here. Um, you can't be creative. You can't think outside the box. You know, you've got to conform. So it's all passed down, I think. But then you have, there's an element of us that just sort of um, rebel against that and refuse to fit into. That's what was my experience. I just didn't fit, you know, and I just refused to. And and fought really hard just to be who I am, but I still find myself slipping back into the 
worrying about what people think and oh I should be doing this and comparing myself to other people and then I go I'm free you know I, I, I'm, I'm just I've got to be me and I was always told you've got to be true to yourself or you'll never be happy and that luckily happened when I was 19 and I'm I just turned 55 so you know 55 in the body about 20 in my head you know and my imagination still six you know so maybe you're luckier then because i stuck a five years old in my mind i'm still five years old so it's a little bit worrying i knew it yeah, six i'm six okay six years old i think i'm about 12. i think i got as far as 12. Oh, okay i think that's when things start to wake up not always in a good way <laughs> So but I, but I, I, loved, I loved what you guys were saying about imagination and um and you know how how you know oh it's just your imagination because it, it it is so real it's almost like it's like dreams as well you know I dream prolifically every night and you know you can just dismiss it as a as a dream or just not real reality it's just another reality you know and another opportunity to to explore who you are of course. or or yep. where you are at the moment because we change all the time. <laughs> yeah Absolutely. no i mean i think that's i think it's very important to acknowledge these kind of things i mean the trouble with our politicians and i dare say there are the equivalents wherever you are is the first thing they do when you get to eat and is to tell you all that sort of stuff's nonsense what counts is power and money and if that's all oh, you're yeah. on then what are we going to do you know yeah well we can change the world you know gutta cavat lapidem the <laughs> Uh, the, the, the drop can bore the stone. It is a very bad translation from Latin, but anyway, the meaning is that. I mean, even a single drop can change everything. And so I think that a lot of this kind, I mean, new literature, experimental way of creating things, magic, opening to different realities will be maybe the solution or can be part of the solution. Mm. If you can imagine a better way, then you can do it. Not always easy, but it's possible, at least. There are plenty of dreamers. Yeah. Were you going to say yeah. something? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Robbie? Yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. sorry. I, I, I appear to be feedbacking. No, sorry. This is my fault. That's, it's Brandy. Hold on. Hold on. I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, it's perfect. perfect. Yeah. Um, I, I think the trouble with the, the, the subtle distortion is that what we're told is not that it's just about power and money, but the real deeper lie that you need to get the power and the money first, and then you can realize your dreams. So that imagination always takes second, third place. Yeah. And by the time you've wasted your entire life getting the money and the power, you've yeah. no energy left for doing the things that, uh, that you really wanted to do and really matter. And um, look, even perhaps for me, even more importantly, don't just matter to you, but matter to the whole of the rest of society. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the kind of thing that you do, John, is, is, is it, it enriches everybody's life. I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of enjoyment doing it, but it brings so much pleasure and stimulation to other people. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, 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 no you, you're, you're, you're more than welcome. Um, and we hope to be there on the 20. Seventh, twenty seventh, fantastic. Well, you can come and get a copy of the book, and I, I, I should, I've got it. I'll bring it with me. You've already got it. Fantastic. Gosh, a very quick off the mark. <laughs> it's only published about a week ago. That was pretty good going. Um, no, I mean it is. You, I think you have to be willing to change, and you have to be willing to work not just for yourself, but for the greater good. Um, Kathleen has just finished a book, which will be out next year, uh, called Time Changes Tarot. It's not, it is actually based on the Rider Waite, but she has expanded it from working sort of individually to working for your community, working for the larger community, and working for the cosmos. And I mean, it's not, I mean, it's an amazing book. I've, I've read it, obviously, and I was absolutely astonished at just how powerful and true it is and how true it is that we can do this, you know, just through tarot, just yeah. <laughs> Using that wrong word. But, well, this is the power of tarot at the end that force you to use your imagination. I yes. mean, if you read tarot, I mean, if you read tarot just 
connecting mm. a series of sentences that is the meaning of the cards to the card this is not reading tarot this is just repeating like a parrot the meaning of the cards but if you read tarot in in a deep way in a real way i mean you open your fantasy you open your imagination and you start creating stories stories that can become real you can see things that they will never be or they can be there i mean this is the power of this is why i love so much tarot well one of my next projects is about creating stories of tarot but we we will talk about that further, as they say, because I want you involved in that one. So I will. You know that Calvino is one of my favorite authors, and he is. I mean, I don't know what you want to do, but he did something that sounds similar. I mean, writing stories just laying down cards. I mean, yes. this was certainly so. So it's it's great. It's beautiful. Why not? I mean, a tarot I use in so many different ways. That is is amazing, and I think every use is legitimate. Is good. Is let's free your imagination. If you what I, I don't know if you ever did an experiment. If you show a tarot cards to a child to never use tarot, and then you say what do you see, you have the most incredible interpretation, the most richer, the most deeper, and you are fascinated. Well, I mean, I did. Uh, Kathleen and I produced something called Story World years ago now about. 15 years ago, we did a whole series of, of separate decks and they were not tarot, they were just illustrations taken from traditional fairy tale and it, it folklore and so forth. We did, uh, we did eight, eight volumes altogether. Um, and this was the idea was that you take your card, spread them out and tell a story. And we took this on the road, we took it to schools and we were astonished and so moved by the way these kids just looked at an image and went, and, and tell you the whole life of the of the character, you know, it was extraordinary. And it came out of that same thing that you were just talking about, Andrea, because when, when our son Emrys was growing up, when he was little, we used to use tarot to tell him stories. Oh, so, I love it. So yes, then, my mother, it's funny because my mother was doing the same to me. So you see the results now. <laughs> no, I like it. Hopefully in, a, in, a, in a year or two, when I've finished off all the other projects, um, There'll be something on how to tell stories with tarot. Why not? We don't need because you're doing it already. But you know, some people will find it useful. Yeah. No, is an hour is over. I know that you have another meeting after this one. So I have to thank everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, to be present here. Uh, above all, if you are coming from distant, strange land with different time zones, that I don't know if it's so hard. I hope it's not a strange hour. But thank you, thank you so much for being here, and thank you, John. It was really, really, really a nice chat. I enjoy it. I had to sip from the cauldron, and I look forward to seeing those of you who can be there on the twenty seventh. There is a rail strike that day, so good luck. Thank you. <laughs> And you're probably okay if you're not maybe but anyway thank you andrea for inviting me it's been great it was a pleasure finally we were able to talk about what we want to talk <laughs> we talk, we won't always we want to have a chat that i mean every time we want to chat is we need hours an hour is never enough never enough never enough but it's nice to talk about everything rather than just the job you're doing at the time you know oh yeah absolutely so again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Splendid first people and see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.